Book 5, Chapters 9 through 11 of the Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 1, by Flavius Josephus, translated by William Whiston. Book 5, Chapters 9 through 11. Chapter 9 How under Eli's government of the Israelites, Booz married Ruth, from whom came Obed the grandfather of David. Now after the death of Samson, Eli the high priest was governor of the Israelites. Under him, when the country was afflicted with a famine, Elimelech of Bethlehem, which is a city of the tribe of Judah, being not able to support his family under so sore a distress, took with him Naomi his wife and the children that were born to him by her, Chilon and Malon, and removed his habitation into the land of Moab. And upon the happy prosperity of his affairs there, he took for his sons wives of the Moabites, Orpah for Chilon and Ruth for Malon. But in the compass of ten years, both Elimelech and a little while after him, the sons, died and naomi being very uneasy at these accidents and not being able to bear her lonesome condition now those that were dearest to her were dead on whose account it was that she had gone away from her own country she returned to it again for she had been informed it was now in a flourishing condition however her daughters-in-law were not able to think of parting with her and when they had a mind to go out of the country with her she could not dissuade them from it and when they insisted upon it, she wished them a more happy wedlock than they had with her sons, and that they might have prosperity in other respects also. And seeing her own affairs were so low, she exhorted them to stay where they were, and not to think of leaving their own country, and partaking with her of that uncertainty under which she must return. Accordingly, Orpah stayed behind, but she took Ruth along with her, as not to be persuaded to stay behind her but would take her fortune with her, whatsoever it should prove. When Ruth was come with her mother-in-law to Bethlehem, Booz, who was near of relation to Elimelech, entertained her, and when Naomi was so called by her fellow-citizens, according to her true name, she said, You might more truly call me Mara. Now Naomi signifies in the Hebrew tongue happiness, and Mara sorrow. It was now reaping time, and Ruth, by the leave of her mother-in-law, went out to glean, that they might get a stock of corn for their food. Now it happened that she came into Boo's field, and after some time Boo's came thither, and when he saw the damsel, he inquired of his servant that was set over the reapers concerning the girl. The servant had a little before inquired about all her circumstances, and told them to his master who kindly embraced her, both on account of her affection to her mother-in-law, and her remembrance of that son of hers to whom she had been married, and wished that she might experience a prosperous condition. So he desired her not to glean, but to reap what she was able, and gave her leave to carry it home. He also gave it in charge to that servant who was over the reapers, not to hinder her when she took it away and bade him gave her dinner, and make her drink when he did the like to the reapers. Now what corn Ruth received of him she kept for her mother-in-law, and came to her in the evening, and brought the ears of corn with her. And Naomi had kept for her a part of such food as her neighbors had plentifully bestowed upon her. Ruth also told her mother-in-law what Booz had said to her, and when the other had informed her that he was near of kin to them, and perhaps was so pious a man as to make some provision for them, she went out again on the days following, to gather the gleanings with Booz's maid-servants. It was not many days before Booz, after the barley was winnowed, slept in his thrashing floor. When Naomi was informed of this circumstance, she contrived it so that Ruth should lie down by him, for she thought it might be for their advantage that he should discourse with the girl. Accordingly, she sent the damsel to sleep at his feet, who went as she bade her, for she did not think it consistent with her duty to contradict any command of her mother-in-law. And at first she lay concealed from booze, as he was fast asleep. But when he awakened about midnight, and perceived a woman lying by him, he asked who she was, 
and when she told him her name, and desired that he whom she owned for her lord would excuse her, he then said no more, but in the morning, before the servants began to set about their work, he awakened her, and bid her take as much barley as she was able to carry, and go to her mother-in-law before anybody there should see that she had lain by him, because it was but prudent to avoid any reproach that might arise on that account, especially when there had been nothing done that was ill. But as to the main point she aimed at, the matter should rest here. He that is nearer of kin than I am, shall be asked whether he wants to take thee to wife. If he says he does, thou shalt follow him. But if he refuse it, I will marry thee, according to the law. When she had informed her mother-in-law of this, they were very glad of it, out of the hope they had that booze would make provision for them. Now about noon Booz went down into the city, and gathered the senate together. And when he had sent for Ruth, he called for her kinsmen also. And when he was come, he said, Dost thou not retain the inheritance of Elimelech and his sons? He confessed that he did retain it, and that he did as he was permitted to do by the laws, because he was their nearest kinsman. Then said Booz, Thou must not remember the laws by halves but do everything according to them for the wife of malon is come hither whom thou must marry according to the law in case thou wilt retain their fields so the man yielded up both the field and the wife to booze who was himself of kin to those that were dead as alleging that he had a wife already and children also so booze called the senate to witness and bid the woman to loose his shoe and spit in his face according to the law and when this was done, Booz married Ruth, and they had a son within a year's time. Naomi was herself a nurse to this child, and by the advice of the women, called him Obed, as being to be brought up in order to be subservient to her in her old age. For Obed in the Hebrew dialect signifies a servant. The son of Obed was Jesse, and David was his son, who was king, and left his dominions to his sons for one and twenty generations. I was therefore obliged to relate this history of Ruth, because I had a mind to demonstrate the power of God, who, without difficulty, can raise those that were of ordinary parentage to dignity and splendor, to which he advanced David, though he was born of such mean parents. Chapter 10 Concerning the Birth of Samuel and how he foretold the calamity that befell the sons of Eli. And now upon the ill state of affairs of the Hebrews, they made war again upon the Philistines. The occasion was this. Eli, the high priest, had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. These sons of Eli were guilty of injustice towards men, and of impiety towards God, and abstained from no sort of wickedness. Some of their gifts they carried off, as belonging to the honorable employment they had. Others of them they took away by violence. They also were guilty of impurity with the women that came to worship God at the tabernacle, obliging some to submit to their lust by force, and enticing others by bribes. Nay, the whole course of their lives was no better than tyranny. Their father therefore was angry at them for such their wickedness and expected that God would suddenly inflict his punishments upon them for what they had done. The multitude took it heinously also. And as soon as God had foretold what calamity would befall Eli's sons, which he did both to Eli himself and to Samuel the prophet, who was yet but a child, he openly showed his sorrow for his son's destruction. I will first dispatch what I have to say about the prophet Samuel, after that we'll proceed to speak of the sons of Eli, and the miseries they brought on the whole people of the Hebrews. Elkanah, a Levite, one of a middle condition among his fellow citizens, and one that dwelled at Ramatham, a city of the tribe of Ephraim, married two wives, Hannah and Penetha. He had children by the latter, but he loved the other best, although she was barren. Now Elkanah came with his wives to the city of Shiloh to sacrifice, for there it was that the tabernacle of God was fixed, as we have formerly said. Now when, after he had sacrificed, he distributed at that festival portions of the flesh to his wives and children, and when Hannah saw the other wife's children sitting around about their mother, she fell into tears, and lamented herself on account of her barrenness and lonesomeness. 
and suffering her grief to prevail over her husband's consolations to her, she went to the tabernacle to beseech God to give her seed, and to make her a mother, and to vow to consecrate the first son she should bear to the service of God, this in such a way that his manner of living should not be like that of ordinary men. And as she continued at her prayers a long time, Eli, the high priest, for he sat there before the tabernacle, bid her go away, thinking she had been disordered with wine. But when she said she had drank water, but was in sorrow for want of children, and was beseeching God for them, he bid her be of good cheer, and told her that God would send her children. So she came to her husband full of hope, and ate her meal with gladness. And when they had returned to their own country, she found herself with child, and they had a son born to them, to whom they gave the name of Samuel, which may be styled one that was asked of God. They therefore came to the tabernacle to offer sacrifice for the birth of the child, and brought their tithes with them. But the woman remembered the vows she had made concerning her son, and delivered him to Eli, dedicating him to God, that he might become a prophet. Accordingly his hair was suffered to grow long, and his drink was water. So Samuel dwelt and was brought up in the temple. But Elkanah had other sons by Hannah and three daughters. Now when Samuel was twelve years old, he began to prophesy, and once when he was asleep, God called to him by his name, and he, supposing he had been called by the high priest, came to him. But when the high priest said he did not call him, God did so thrice. Eli was then so far illuminated that he said to him, Indeed, Samuel, I was silent now as well as before. It is God that calls thee. Do thou therefore signify it to him, and say, I am here ready. So when he heard God speak again, he desired him to speak, and to deliver what oracles he pleased to him, for he would not fail to perform any ministration whatsoever he should make use of him in. To which God replied, Since thou art here ready, learn what miseries are coming upon the Israelites, such indeed as words cannot declare, nor faith believe. For the sons of Eli shall die on one day, and the priesthood shall be transferred into the family of Eleazar. For Eli hath loved his sons more than he hath loved my worship, and to such a degree as is not for their advantage. Which message Eli obliged the prophet by oath to tell him, for otherwise he had no inclination to afflict him by telling it. And now Eli had a more sure expectation of the perdition of his sons, but the glory of Samuel increased more and more, it being found by experience that whatsoever he prophesied came to pass accordingly. Chapter 11 Herein is declared what befell the sons of Eli, the ark, and the people, and how Eli himself died miserably. About this time it was that the Philistines made war against the Israelites, and pitched their camp at the city Aphek. Now when the Israelites had expected them a little while, the very next day they joined battle, and the Philistines were conquerors, and slew above four thousand of the Hebrews, and pursued the rest of their multitude to their camp. So the Hebrews, being afraid of the worst, sent to the senate and to the high priest, and desired that they would bring the ark of God, that by putting themselves in array, when it was present with them, they might be too hard for their enemies, as not reflecting that he who had condemned them to endure such calamities was greater than the ark, and for whose sake it was that this ark came to be honored. So the ark came, and the sons of the high priest with it, having received a charge from their father, that if they pretended to survive the taking of the ark, they should come no more into his presence. For Phineas officiated already as high priest, his father having resigned his office to him, by reason of his great age. So the Hebrews were full of courage, as supposing that, by the coming of the ark, they should be too hard for their enemies. Their enemies also were greatly concerned, and were afraid of the ark's coming to the Israelites. However, the upshot did not prove agreeable to the expectation of both sides. But when the battle was joined, that victory which the Hebrews expected was gained by the Philistines, and that defeat the Philistines were afraid of, fell to the lot of the Israelites, and therefore they found that they had put their trust in the ark in vain, for they were presently beaten as soon as they came to a close fight with their enemies, and lost about thirty thousand men, among whom were the sons of the high priest. 
but the ark was carried away by the enemies. When the news of this defeat came to Shiloh, with that of the captivity of the ark, for a certain young man, a Benjamite, who was in the action, came as a messenger thither. The whole city was full of lamentations. And Eli the high priest, who sat upon a high throne at one of the gates, heard their mournful cries, and supposed that some strange thing had befallen his family. So he sent for the young man, and when he understood what had happened in the battle, he was not much uneasy as to his sons, or what was told him withal about the army, as having beforehand known by divine revelation that those things would happen, and having himself declared them beforehand. For what sad things come unexpectedly they distress men the most. But as soon as he heard the ark was carried captive by his enemies, he was very much grieved at it, because it fell out quite differently from what he expected. So he fell down from his throne and died, having in all lived ninety-eight years, and of them retained the government forty. On the same day his son Phineas's wife died also, as not able to survive the misfortune of her husband, for they told her of her husband's death as she was in labor. However, she bare a son at seven months, who lived, and to whom they gave the name of Ichabod, which name signifies disgrace, and this because the army received a disgrace at this time. Now Eli was the first of the family of Ithamar, the other son of Aaron, that had the government, for the family of Eleazar officiated as high priest at first, the son still receiving that honor from the father which Eleazar bequeathed to his son Phineas, after whom Abiezer his son took the honor, and delivered it to his son, whose name was Buki, from whom his son Ozi received it, after whom Eli, of whom we have been speaking, had the priesthood, and so he and his posterity until the time of Solomon's reign, but then the posterity of Eleazar resumed it. End of Book 5, Chapters 9-11 through 11. End of the Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 1, by Flavius Josephus, translated by William Whiston.